um, that you rescue something, uh, an animal or a person from a situation, it means that that situation was intolerable. And we want to put it into those situations. So I'm going to tell you about the practices and the events and the circumstances that we're trying to put it into that we're having to rescue these cats from to begin with. Because we are very lucky to be able to be so close to them and see them in person, but they all suffered to come here. And we want to put an end to that suffering. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what their lives would be like if they were living in the wild, because we think that's where wild animals belong, is in the wild. And then I'll tell you a little bit about their story and how they came to be here instead. Any other questions about anything? All right, great. Sharon is leaving the backyard with 18. As you come out, if you look on your left, you'll see a bobcat back in the back of her enclosure. Get a good one, Andrew. And if you look on the right, you will also see another bobcat. The bobcat on your right is Rain Dance, and the bobcat on your left is Angelica. Of course, they are called bob bobcats because they have bobbed tails, they have short tails, and if you look at Rain Dance's tail there, you'll notice that it's black on the top and white on the bottom. That's a characteristic of a bobcat. It's one of the characteristics that differentiates it from a lynx. A lot of people will get lynx and bobcats mixed up. They get them confused because they look very similar. They have the tufts on the, eel, on the ears and they're kind of spotted and they have short tails. But the bobcat's tail is going to be black on the top and white on the bottom. A lynx tail is going to be black all the way around, like somebody dipped it down in a well of black ink. But it's no coincidence that there are similarities between them. There are a lot of experts who think that thousands of years ago, the lynx came over on a land bridge from Europe into the Americas and eventually became the bobcat. So they are in the same genus, but not the same species. In the wild, you'll find bobcats, of course, all throughout the US and in some parts of Canada and Mexico. What you may not be aware of is that there's a difference in their size depending on where they live. The northern bobcats, the ones that live in Minnesota and Wisconsin, are much larger than the ones here in Florida. A Florida bobcat's not gonna be much bigger than about 15 pounds. That's our wildest cat we have over there. That's Jack. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing that's gonna be really unnatural to you. Again, I know you came here because you like cats and I've already asked you to not blow kisses at these guys. I'm going to ask you not to pet Jack, and the reason is because when we pet them, they like it and then they want to follow you out into the parking lot, and they're not afraid of the cars, and we're trying to keep them out of the parking lot, so if you could um, let him rub up against your leg, but please don't pet him. Jack, stop tempting everyone. <laughs> Jack knows the three-foot rule, and that's why Jack is still alive. Yeah. Back to the bobcat. <laughs> So back to the bobcat. So there's this geographic difference in their size. So you have the Florida bobcats are a lot smaller. They're not going to be much bigger than about 15 pounds. What you're going to find them preying on most often is rabbit and hare and the smaller animals like that, but they can kill deer. We have a video oh, wow. of a bobcat on our website taking down a deer. It jumps up, up on the back of the neck and grabs back like this, and all four of that deer's legs just fly right out, right out from underneath it. So they are still predators. This is Even though they're small, they are predators. That's what they're built and made to do. Why are Rain Dance and Angelica here instead of uh, in the wild? And by the way, Rain Dance is one that would be considered more of a northern bobcat. And she came from a fur farm. If she had not come here, she would have been killed for her fur. Fur farms are not a fun time for these guys, and the way they kill them is not nice. They just want that nice white speckled fur on the belly. They're not interested in the rest of the cat, and it's usually used just for decoration. There's nobody out there freezing to death without a bobcat fur coat. They just put it around the sleeves and the collar to make it look pretty. So we're very glad she's here instead. Our founder bought all 56 cats from the fur farm that she came from 18 wow. years ago and got the guy to sign a contract agreeing he wouldn't sell, kill cats for their fur anymore, and that's how this whole place started. And she's a veteran of Big Cat Rescue. She's one of those cats. Again, her name is Rain Dance. And uh, then the cat back there, Angelica, I don't know if you got to see her. We call her Kika for short. She's also a bobcat. She was somebody's pet at one time, and the lady's house was foreclosed on, and she couldn't keep her, so she brought her here. And believe it or not, about half the cats that live here were somebody's pet at one time or another. And this is one of the practices and the circumstances that we're actually trying to put an end to. Uh, it usually never ends up being pretty for animal or person. And we'll talk about that a lot as we go along. In the early days, those first 56 cats that our founder brought back, her initial plan 
was to try and find good homes for them, good personal, to place them personally. And in almost every situation, within weeks or months, the people would come right back to her and say, I can't handle this, I, I can't keep this animal. So it turned into a real sad situation, and then she started visiting breeding facilities and seeing these horrible conditions these animals were living in, and she realized that uh, there was a real problem with this exotic pet trade. We'll talk about that more as we go along. Here's a great demonstration of why we have the three-foot rule. You can see uh, his paw is sticking out of the enclosure wire. <laughs> We were just talking about bobcats, and a bobcat is a representative of what we call a lesser cat. You can divide all of these cats into two basic groups. You have great cats and lesser cats. And the great cats are great cats mostly for one main reason. There are several differences between great cats and lesser cats, but the main difference is that a great cat can roar. And it's because it has a floating bone under its larynx called a hyoid bone. And this is what gives it the ability to roar. And the rest of the cats don't have this, so they are considered lesser cats. I'll tell you what, Hana, if you kind of pull down that way so that he's facing Jumanji. This, is, this cat's name is Jumanji. So he's the first great cat that we're meeting today. And there are four species of great cats, lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars. That's it, the rest are considered lesser cats. He is a black leopard, so this is the first representative of a great cat we're meeting today. He's a melanistic leopard. So a black leopard is not a different species. He's not really what you'd call a black panther. That's probably the first thing that you thought when you saw him. But there's not a cat roaming around in the wild that is his size that is a solidly black color. They have spots. And, uh, uh, so uh, those spots go all the way down to his skin. So he's considered a melanistic leopard. And two golden leopards can produce a black leopard. It's just a color variation that happens. And the same thing happens with jaguars. So black leopards and ja black jaguars are really what we're talking about when we're talking about black panthers. The leopards are the smallest of the great cats, topping out at about 150 pounds. But they can be as small as about 80 pounds. And some of our leopards are that small. But in spite of the fact that they are a little bit on the smaller side, in the wild they can kill an animal that weighs twice as much. He could kill an animal that weighs twice as much as he does. And oftentimes what they'll do is drag it up into a tree. And they'll just leave it there and come back and feed on it night after night. So this helps to keep other predators from coming and stealing it from them. You've probably seen pictures of leopards sleeping in trees. They love to hang out in trees. Their front paws rotate around a little bit more efficiently than some of the other types of cats. So they're good at negotiating those skinny branches when they get up in the trees. So that's what you would find him doing in the wild. And you would probably find him in a rainforest in Southeast Asia. The darker colored cats like this, the melanistic ones, you usually find in the rainforest because that camouflage is a, it's a good color for them. It's very dark in a rainforest. There's a lot of foliage and it's really dark. So you'll find your black jaguars in the rainforest in South America, but your leopards you find in Asia and Africa. You find them on the other side of the world. And leopards have the widest distribution of any exotic cat around the world. It doesn't mean to say they're not critically endangered in some parts of their range, but they have a wide distribution around the world from Africa to Southeast Asia. So that's probably where you would find him hanging out in the wild, preying mostly on uh, the, the hoof stock, your Impala, your Reebok, and things like that. Anything that's like a deer is what they like the best. But they'll prey in about 90 different species, so they have a flexible diet. He also came from the exotic pet trade. There was a time when our founder would go to auctions and she would buy cats just because she knew the fate that they were going to end up with if she didn't. She doesn't do that anymore because she realized that by paying for the cats, by putting money into this practice, that she was just supporting it. Mm -hmm. But he is an example of one that was purchased in that way and uh, was raised here. So he came from the exotic pet trade. So Believe it or not, you got lots of people who want to keep leopards as pets. Did he get here as a small Yes, he was a cub when he came here. Okay, so did you, did you, did you handle them and keep them no. next to humans? Do you try to no, we do not them? touch them. We are a no-contact facility. The mm -hmm. only ones that touch them are the vets if they have to and maybe senior staff in some situations where it's absolutely necessary. But this is a no-contact facility. There's a lot of people out there who underestimate the power of these animals. And all it would take is for one of us to get some small injury and we might be required to put that cat down. So we would not jeopardize their lives in that way. And also, we feel that they are wild animals and as a part of respecting their dignity as wild animals, even though they are living in captivity, we should respect those boundaries and treat them as the wild animals that they are. Now that's not to say they don't get attention, trust me. 
They are, we, our keepers are uh, focused on making their lives better all the time. So we, what we do is a lot of what we call enrichment. So when you see balls and toys and pumpkins and uh, little hammocks that are made, we make the hand make these little hammocks and uh, little wooden platforms and stuff. That's all made to make their lives more comfortable. And of course, we're talking to them and engaging with them that way. We're doing just about everything outside of touching them that we can do to make their lives more comfortable here. Uh, but we are very careful about that, again, to respect their dignity and because we want to really try and send the right message, which is that wild animals are not animals that are supposed to be petted. If they were, then we could go up to one that's living in the wild and do that, but nobody would ever, hopefully, be dumb enough <laughs> to walk up to a black leopard or a lion or a tiger and try to pet it in the wild. And, uh, and I'll be talking to you a lot about these issues as we go along. They all eat uh, cows and chickens. We feed them beef quarters, chicken quarters. They have to have raw muscle meat, raw organ meat, and raw bone to meet their nutritional needs. And so that's what they get. The great cats are gonna eat about 10 to 15 pounds of meat of raw meat. It has shorter legs, a shorter tail, it has more of a, a wider skull, it looks kind of more like a, it has a pit bullish appearance, I guess, in the face. Now look at his rosettes. We call them spots, but they're actually rosettes. They're hollow, I guess you call them hollow, or like circles. Now some of them may look like they have a little dot in the middle, but if it were a jaguar, it would be really obvious. The rosettes would be bigger, and there'd be a really obvious dot right in the middle of them. Of course, the jaguars live in South America, whereas the leopards live in Africa and Asia. What's he doing? <laughs> I mean, how do you mean? I mean, I see a lot of pets taking the He is waiting for dinner. Oh. And he saw Gail. Gail is our operations manager, so she's one of the feeders. That's something you may notice about this tour is, uh, you know, you might see some other people walking around, especially people driving golf carts, and you'll see the cats get excited about them. You see the cats look at me or Hana and see Hana in a golf cart, and they couldn't care less. Because Hana and I have never fed any of these cats. They know who brings food and who doesn't. He saw Gail go down there with the golf cart. And feeding time is after this tour. Right around 4.30 is when they're going to start feeding. And that's why you guys picked a good tour to come on, because they're starting to get excited about it. They food. eat once a day, six days a week. They're fasted one day because they would not eat every day in the wild. So their digestive system needs a chance to rest. But it also helps us to monitor their health. When we come back after a fasting day and bring food, they should be pretty hungry. If they're not, then that could be a sign something's wrong. So it's another way we can monitor their health, which we have to be really proactive about, because it's not like they can raise up a paw and say, hey, guess what, I have a tummy ache. So we have to look for signs that there's something wrong. Uh, and again, you know, they're hunters. They're, they're what we call apex predators. They're more or less at the top of the food chain, wherever they live. And uh, this is very important. Studies will always show that when these top predators start disappearing from ecosystems, those ecosystems start breaking down. It's very important that we have a sufficient number of these guys in the wild if we want their entire habitat to remain healthy. And they're made to kill and eat prey. That's what they're made to do. The sharp teeth, the sharp claws. His back legs, you might notice, are a little higher. On most cats, it's a little higher. That's for lunging. Oh. Because he's depending on surprise to get his prey. He doesn't want his prey to run from him because he's not likely to chase them down. They're more likely to be faster than he is. And so he's going to be really, really uh, patient. The people have filmed a leopardess in the wild sitting perfectly still for two hours. And then when the prey comes by unsuspecting, bam, use those legs, lunge out, grab the back of the neck, and uh, hopefully puncture a main artery. here. Reno was a circus performer oh, yeah. and he did not even know how to get up into a tree when he came here. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we think some of the uh, ways that things that people are using them for are inappropriate because they're denied an opportunity to engage in natural behaviors. So when he came here, they would put really nice tasty treats in cardboard boxes and then put the boxes up in where the trees 
fork out like this so that he'd be forced to get up there and figure out how to get up there to get the tasty treat, which he did, and he has become very, very good at hanging out in trees. You will notice, yes, he does look very skinny. There's a lot of cats that came here malnourished to begin with because the people who had them really could not afford to feed them an appropriate diet. So we have some cats that had shown up and they'd been fed dry dog food most during most of their formative years. And some of them, when they're really skinny like that, when they get here, no matter how much we feed them, they never completely recover from it. They're, they're always a little bit thin. He's rather a show off, usually. As, oh, let me turn and make sure you're getting my best side. Oh, oh, look at my teeth. Can we do that one more time to look at what you're doing? Just one more time. Come on. Doesn't he has a, yeah, they each kind of have their own individual yeah. face, and this is really, uh, really, really nice. Oh, very clean. Are you thinking about opening your mouth first? Come on. One more time. Aren't you sleepy? Don't you need to be on? One more time. Come on. Look at that tail. Yeah, he's probably mad because Sundari's getting attention and he's not, but uh, we can kind of talk about both of them. So Sundari over here was somebody's pet, that, uh, and they surrendered their pet to us. When people surrender a cat as that they've had as a pet, we ask them to sign a contract saying that they will never go out and get another one. Because what happens is people get into a pattern where they want cubs. They get the cubs, they have a great relationship with the cubs, the animal gets older, they want to go dump the adult somewhere and go back and get another cub. And we don't want this process to keep going, so we ask them to say, to, to swear that they will not do that anymore. To give you an idea of how bad of a problem this is, of how much this is going on, in 2008 we had 66 individual opportunities, separate opportunities to take in smaller cats. Not a single one of those 66 people would sign that contract, so we did not take the cat. Oh we gosh. were wanted to, we had the space, we were willing to do it, but they would not promise that they wouldn't go get another one. So they wanted to get rid of it bad enough to call us, but they wouldn't uh, promise they wouldn't get another one. So that's people. kind of what's going on. At some point, Big Cat Rescue was turning away about 300 cats every year. That's, uh, it's a real problem.